So we do understand that the way that you really have to fix the concussion has a lot to do with visual scanning, mm -hmm. right? And so that's why in the protocol that we developed, visual scanning, and this is what all the research talks about, mm -hmm. but this is also where I can screen a child or an adult, I can screen anybody with just visual scanning and, and I can do it on FaceTime. They can be on the other side of the United States and I can identify almost instantly if there's a problem and significant enough problems. We tell those people, you know what, you need to just get on a plane and get out here and spend a week with us. Welcome to the Miracle Academy. This is your host, Scotty Cooper, and this is where miracles are expected. Welcome to the Miracle Academy podcast. I'm your host, Scotty Cooper. Today, I'm with Dr. Cooper. And today, we're going to be talking a little bit about a concussion uh, screening we did that I think is going to surprise you. Yes. Surprised me. Yes. So but several years ago, we got to um, work with a local university to evaluate their athletes as part of their pre-season um, physical. And what we we're doing very specifically was screening for concussion mm -hmm. using two separate principles. Number one was posture, looking for the forward head tilt. Mm -hmm. And then secondly, balance tracking. Mm -hmm. So why did we do balance tracking? What is that? Because I said it would be very important to do <laughs> that. So balance tracking, there's an intimate relationship between the vestibular system in the brain and the frontal lobe. Mm. And so we were looking to see how well did the frontal lobe perform. Now, before we talk about that, let's talk about the forward head tilt. I think that's really important because when we look at a person's head tilt, that means like how far forward is their head in a normal posture. Mm -hmm. And what we know is that every translation of measurement, the farther and farther and farther, the more that frontal lobe is sitting inside the back of, or in the front of the skull. And so if a person who naturally is like this has an impact, like they hit the, their head, they're gonna smack that frontal lobe inside the cranium. Mm. Right, so that was, that's a really easy identification. So we took those people and we also looked at then the balance tracking. So for those that don't know, what's controlled by that frontal lobe? Well, the frontal lobe is how you perceive the world. It's how you see everything around you. It's how you, you see lights and sounds and interpret things. It gives you a sense of, of, of balance and allows you to perceive all those things, concentrations there attention, short-term memory, patience, temper, being able to process. In other words, you have to read the same thing two or three times. If you have to do that, you're not processing. Mm -hmm. uh, mental balance, emotional balance, people with anxiety, depression, that's all created there in the frontal lobe. When that frontal lobe has been damaged, then what happens is we shift the neurology from really the frontal lobe to the mid and brain stem where the amygdala is and that part of the brain is really about survival. Mm. And so unfortunately now everything in this person's life becomes like survival. Everything's catastrophic. It's like, gosh darn it, I didn't get my classes, right? And it's like a cataclysmic problem, yeah, right? Because they're not in the frontal lobe, they're operating in that brainstem and the amygdala and, and it's all about, you know, preservation. Got it. Yeah. With the, the bounce tracking, mm -hmm. And you said that that's the, it's related to the vestibular balance. Right, so it's an electronic test where you, you stand on very, very sensitive plates. Uh -huh. And the plates measure how much movement you have. Now you're gonna be in a position where your arms, your elbows are, or your, sorry, your hands are on your, your hips, your eyes are closed, and you're standing up straight. And we're literally measuring how much sway and movement that an athlete has. Now these athletes, this is really interesting because these athletes were non-contact sport athletes mm. like golfers <laughs> or track 
or baseball and softball mm -hmm. or volleyball. This isn't football. This isn't rugby. It's not soccer, mm -hmm. right? These were non-contact athletes. Here's what we find in those that realm. If you think of a college athlete being anywhere from 17 to 19 or maybe 20 to up to 24, when they do that balance tracking, we want to see them moving in, in their, their three 20, 20 second trials and then we'll, we will do an average of the three. We want to see that like a single digit number. Mm -hmm. If that person moves, let's say 10 centimeters, so a double digit number, they're in probably about the 80th percentile. That means that they're better balanced than 80% of people their age. Yeah. Now, here's a question for you because you played college sports. Yeah. Would you expect a college athlete to be only 80% better than most of the people their age? No. No. If that person scored at, and, and this was very common, I mean, this was more like the reality. If they scored at about a 20, mm -hmm. a 20 put them in about the, the 60th percentile. Mm -hmm. If they scored, like I say, a 23 or a 24, so that means on average, three trials, 24 centimeters of sway, mm -hmm. one way or another, and we can see which way they're swaying. We can, it calculates that and it shows us all the points. But that person would be in the 31st percentile. Wow. So let me ask you a question. Mm -hmm. If you, as a student, came home with a test <laughs> where you scored a 31 out of 100, yeah. what grade did you get and how would we feel about this? I'd get an F and yes. I'd get a... <laughs> well, that might may not be true, but you'd be disappointed and right, I would be of too. Of course. Right? So, <clears throat> very interesting to find that the majority of these athletes, the, they fell into this, this realm. Right. So, what percentage of athletes were in that realm? The percentage of athletes, and this was shocking, of non-contact sports was over 71%. That blew my mind. Right. That means I, out of every, like, 52, 37 of them are susceptible. Right. Now, of that group as well, over 13% had already suffered a concussion. Right. I think the craziest part about that, too, was that the trainers didn't even know. And they had no clue. They had no idea. Well, this is the problem because the systems that are out there are so antiquated. And even with everybody really wanting to focus on this, whether you're talking about from the Pop Warner level to the high school level to like sitting down and taking those tests. Yeah. Right. Those pre-test screening tests. Now, let me ask you a question. How do you think that the coaches, the doctors and the parents feel about those pre-screening tests that they use in the typical high school and college format? Well, speaking as a player, I think that they hated it because it was just like a a chore. Right. But what did the parents, the doctors and the coaches think? I mean, they thought that it was. Right. So what was the problem with it? It's easy to, as an athlete, to fail it so that if you had a concussion, you get to stay in the game. That's exactly right. And everyone wants you to stay in the game. So an athlete, do they care? Do they want to be on the sidelines or do they want to get back into the next play? Want to play. Absolutely. It's so subjective. That the problem is, is you, it's unreliable. Right. Right now, it's their gold standard. Right. But that's because they haven't yet really done the program and, and learned what we want to teach them. Right. Right. I think one of the things that we've talked about before, you and I, is that when, after a concussion, looking at a computer screen is one of the worst things you could do. Exactly. So why is your only way to test it something that's going to be detrimental to you? Right. Well, so we do understand that the way that you really have to fix the concussion has a lot to do with visual scanning, mm -hmm. right? And so that's why in the protocol that we developed, visual scanning, and this is what all the research talks about, mm -hmm. but this is also where I can screen a child or an adult, I can screen anybody with just visual scanning and, and I can do it on FaceTime. They could be on the other side of the United States and I can identify almost instantly if there's a problem and significant enough problems, we tell those people, you know what, you need to just 
get on a plane and get out here and spend a week with us. Right. With the screening we did with that college, I don't know if you remember, but we had as a gift to the, to the college, we said, let's take one of the athletes and let's one of your worst scoring ones and let's fix her and see what happens. Yeah, she started in the third percentile. <laughs> it was terrible. Mm -hmm. She was terrible. So this was a senior that played college, uh, played college softball. Right. She was a pitcher. And in softball, they're a pitcher and a hitter, a lot of, a lot of Shohei Otani-ish, right? And she came because she had injured her knee. Right. Right. But what you and I understand is that the person that has the concussion, because their eyes can't track mm -hmm. appropriately, they have more susceptibility of having impacts. And in those impacts, we find that shoulder labrums and ACLs in the knee I mean, that's almost like four times more likely that that's what's going to be injured. Right. So as soon as we heard that there was an ACL, we went right to concussion evaluation. And, and that's kind of how that whole thing evolved. Right. So she started um, as an athlete her senior year. And when she got to us, she was batting close to 200. Right. And if you remember, as soon as we started making corrections, I mean, it took her maybe two visits with us right. before she started to see a difference. Yeah. And athletically, she ended her season batting 433 mm -hmm. or 427. 427. And pitching, her ERA was a 2.33. Right. That's which, wild. That's wild. In, in the major leagues, that girl is like. <laughs> a billionaire <laughs> she's gonna own the texas ranger sometime soon right? right so um yeah that was pretty crazy but the coolest part was is you went from this this athlete that was really despondent really um, unhappy really sad about her condition to winning the conference's player of the year mm -hmm. that's amazing yeah that's amazing yeah and i think too just like it wasn't just athletically, but as you said, like in school, in every, her whole life improved. Yeah. And um, that was pretty amazing. Well, we had some really great footage um, of her telling that story. Right. What first brought me in here into Cooperstown, I was playing at a game and there was a play, a pickle play at second base and I had to go cover it. And when I did, the girl straight ran into my knee and it just dislocated my knee. And so my coach from my university uh, told me about uh, Cooperstown, so I decided to come. Prior to my knee injury, I had three previous concussions. Uh, one when I was 15, and then two uh, this past year for my junior year of softball. So I definitely saw a performance difference after my concussion there, uh, for my junior year because as when I started there, uh, I started actually pretty strong, so I was just like leading the conference and everything. But as soon as I got my concussions, everything started like slowly going down. My performance started to change. I, I could say, within two adjustments I had here at Cooperstown, because my hitting was a lot better. Um, my pitching got a lot better. I couldn't throw a full game, and I was able to throw a full game. Uh, within two sessions of this. Compared to last year, I didn't feel like I was doing too good, so I really, I really have high expectations to winning anything towards the end. But as soon as I started getting going, I was like, hey, maybe I still have a chance. I received a conference player of the year for 2016, 2017. My ending stats were, for batting, I ended with the 427, I believe, and my stats for pitching the ERA was 2.33. So before I started, I felt exhausted, tired, and unhappy. After, I started feeling um, more energetic, hopeful. So if an athlete came up to me wanting to improve their performance, I would definitely recommend them to Cooperstown and basically tell them my story and how it completely changed me in every aspect of my life. And it could do wonders and miracles for them as well. You know, for athletes that maybe don't know or they're they're interested to know like how can I get screened you know what would you tell to that person or someone that's like I I want to learn more 
you know, they can go to our website, mm -hmm. Cooperstown Cairo, mm -hmm. and look at, it's under breaking boundaries mm -hmm. in concussion rehabilitation. Mm -hmm. There's also a page on Facebook about... Um, I think most of it's on our Cooperstown page, yeah. though. I think that's where yeah. they could probably find everything. Right. And then um, in a very short time frame, we will be launching our program, teaching doctors, or hoping to have thousands of doctors around the world being able to do our work mm -hmm. um, and um, be certified in it. And, you know, that's just people we're saving. Right. People whose lives are just completely changing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, thank you so much for being on this episode of the Miracle Academy podcast. Yeah. I, I hope that, you know, you watching this, you're like, wow, I didn't even realize that. And this is college athletes, too, we're talking about. I think it's um, eye-opening for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. So Eye-opening for us. Yeah, it was. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for being on the episode. Thanks. And um, this is the Miracle Academy podcast where miracles are expected. Thank you so much. Yeah.